Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you bright and early in the morning to sing the praises of the great High King, to hear Him speak from His Holy Word. It's good to be with you. Last night, you remember that we launched, we bat, led off last night with a theology of fearing God. That from first creation to new creation, from Eden to the new Jerusalem, we had to explore in the sacred text a theology of fearing God. We had to build a theology of God from the ground up. We had to look at the reasons the Scriptures give for why we should fear God. We saw three of those reasons. We should fear God, the Scriptures say, because of His unparalleled power in creation. We should fear God because of the unrivaled supremacy of His perfections. And we should fear God because of the undeserved grace and salvation. And we just have five five reasons why you should pursue the fear of God with with passion and intensity. And all of those come from the Bible. And what that was, was preparatory. It was setting the stage. It was putting the ball on the tee for the rest of the sermons. Now we look at individual texts, the pillar text, the key text, the crucial text, the, the capital texts in which the fear of God is commanded. And we have to. We have to. If you're going to do a conference on fearing God, you have to preach from Ecclesiastes chapter 12. So that's where we'll be this morning. And I want to begin by saying that every classic mystery novel has the same features about it that makes it truly great. I don't know if you're into mystery novels, but if you are, each one of them has the same five features that makes it great and lasting. In other words, you want to write a masterpiece, you want to write a bestseller that lasts for decades or centuries after you live, here's what it has to have. Number one, number one, this is not really, you don't have to record this, it's just for you. If you're interested in writing a novel, here it is. Uh, the, 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 The most captivating mystery novels have got to have complex characters that are both intriguing and appealing. You've got to have great characters. Number two, it's obvious, but the great mystery novels have to have a plot that both baffles you and fascinates you at the same time. It's got to be suspenseful. It's got to be dramatic. I'm going somewhere with this. Number three, this is the trickiest part, but the greatest mystery novels in history actually give away the ending before the ending. Have you noticed that? They leave little clues along the way. They scatter the clues like breadcrumbs that that you almost don't even notice at the time until you get to the ending, the final scene, and then you see how everything in the movie lined up, everything in the story lined up. You have to have that for a mystery novel. Number four, the best mysteries trick you into making you think that you know what the ending is going to be, don't they? They make you think you know exactly what's coming, only a thrilling, only to have a a dramatic and thrilling plot twist at the end. That you could have never predicted. And finally, number five, you have got to have a killer ending. You want to write something that lasts, it's got to have an incredible ending. It's got to be a dramatic, nail-biting final scene where the secret is revealed. And it's got to be so suspenseful that it was worth the wait to get there. What is my point? My point is, that is exactly what the book of Ecclesiastes is. It's a mystery novel. It's not a murder mystery. It's a theological mystery novel. It's exactly what it is. It's a mystery novel about the meaning of life. And in it, Solomon included all of the components that not merely make it suspenseful, but make it the most eternally significant mystery written in human history. That is the book of Ecclesiastes. And this morning, we are going to do what you should never do to a mystery novel. We're going to skip ahead to the end. We're going to see the surprise ending of Ecclesiastes. And mark my words, it will not be a disappointment. We're going to spoil the ending, but it's not going to ruin the ending. It's not going to ruin the surprise because the surprise ending at the ending is the meaning of life itself. And the meaning of life itself just happens to be the theme of this very conference. And if you've ever read the book of Ecclesiastes, you know that Solomon does not take it easy on you. Chapter after chapter, Solomon steps on your toes, boxes your ears, 
and bosses you around and tells you how it is, not because he's a jerk, but because there is so much at stake in this thing called life and what is beyond life. And you see, that is his heart. You see, the point is, the issue is, the urgency for him is what we do in life echoes into eternity. And you see, that's what makes Ecclesiastes so intriguing and, and tantalizing. It, it, it's a theological mystery novel about the meaning of life. It's a who done it about who done it and who done it is the God who created everything. God himself is the meaning of life or should I say fearing God himself is the meaning of life. And this weekend that's exactly what we're talking about, isn't it? We're talking about fearing God, one of the most unknown and underrated and misrepresented and underappreciated and yet valuable doctrines in the entirety of the Christian life. And the reason for that is because it is the meaning of life. Who knew? And you know the ending. You know what he says. When the matter at the end of the day, when the matter has been heard, fear God and keep His commandments. There's the ending. You know what that is, the meaning of life. That is the purpose of your existence, to fear God and keep His commandments. And that's very interesting, isn't it? That that would be the ending, that that is the meaning of life, because again, fearing God, we wrestled with this last night, that, that doesn't seem compatible, that doesn't seem consistent with the rest of the, the, the Christian life. I mean, how do you fear a God that you're supposed to love? How does this work? And yet what we saw last night is, is fearing God is not separate from faith in God. It is not separate from loving God or trusting God or depending on God or being exhilarated with God. Rather, fear of God is all of those things combined. And the Bible is unmistakable about the fear of God. It is the beginning of knowledge. It is the beginning of wisdom. It is the fountain of life. It is the spring of holy living. It's healing to the body. It's refreshment to the bones. And in Solomonic terms, it is the purpose of our very existence. And that right there makes it the essence of practical, doesn't it? So here we go. The most crucial central text on the fearing on fearing God in the pages of the Bible, Ecclesiastes 12. Turn there and I'm going to read the whole chapter. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 1 through 14. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years arrive when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Remember your Creator implied there before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dim and the clouds return after the rain. Remember your Creator in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the men of valor shall stoop. When the, when the molars grow idle because they are few and those who look in, look in the windows grow dim. And the doors shall be shut in the street. And the sound of the mill grows quiet. When one arises at the sound of a bird. When all the daughters of song shall be muffled. When they fear from the heights and the terrors in the street. <laughs> Remember your Creator before, the, before the, the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and the caperberry grows ineffective. For man goes to his eternal home and the mourners shall mourn in the streets. Implied here, remember your Creator before the cord of silver is snapped. And the bowl of gold is cracked. And the jar at the well is shattered. And the wheel at the cistern is broken. And the dust returns to the earth when it was. And the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Futility of futilities. Or vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Everything is futility. And what remains, the preacher was a wise man. He taught the people knowledge. 
he pondered and searched and, in, and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought words of pleasure and upright writing words of truth. The words of wise men are like goads. And they are, and the masters of collections are like tent pegs, firmly driven. They were given by one shepherd. And beyond these, be warned, my son, the making of many books, there is no end, and much study wearies the body. But the end of the matter of everything has been heard. Here it is. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this applies to every person. For God will bring every work in judgment, everything that is hidden, with whether it is good or whether it is evil. This is the very word of the living God. This morning, I want you to see from that text three prerequisites. Three holy prerequisites. Three holy prerequisites that are absolutely necessary to find ultimate meaning and satisfaction in life. That's where we're going. Three holy prerequisites absolutely necessary to find ultimate meaning and satisfaction in life. And these are going to build upon one another and they will culminate in the fear of God, which is number three. But two prerequisites before we get there. Prerequisite number one. Number one, remember your Creator. Remember your Creator. Because have you ever wondered why people grow cranky and bitter with age? I mean, there's that, there's that rumor that elderly people grow cranky and, el and, and bitter and cantankerous, but have you ever considered why that is? Why do that? Why do people go to the grave bitter and angry? The reason why they do, you understand, is because they feel cheated by life. That's why. They're cynical, sinister and they're sarcastic because they feel ripped off. They had all these insatiable longings to be satisfied their whole lives long, but nothing to ever truly satisfy them. Like a mirage in the desert when they actually got to where they thought the satisfaction would be. There was nothing there but disappointment. And yet the real reason, the real reason why go, people go to the grave cranky and cantankerous, Solomon says is because they don't remember their Creator in the days of their youth. Look at verse 1. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. I shouldn't have noticed who Solomon's talking to. He's not talking to senior, senior citizens, although you are welcome to join the party. He's not talking to people in nursing homes, although they're probably welcome to join in live stream. He's talking to youth. He, he, he's, talking, he's picking up people in their prime, pursuing education and careers and love and family and marriage and, and entertainment and fulfillment and financial stability, which is really interesting because those are the very same things that you are pursuing. You are the audience. He's talking to you. But blink. Before you know it, you will be in a nursing home about to step off this planet into eternity. And that right there is what drives Solomon to say, remember your Creator in the days of your youth. And remembering your Creator, remembering the One who brought you into existence while you still can is one of the prerequisites necessary to find meaning and satisfaction in this life. The question is, what does that mean to remember your Creator? What does that mean to remember the One who brought you into existence? And I think it's clear He doesn't merely mean that you try not to become an atheist. He doesn't merely mean that you write yourself cheesy reminders on the, on the bathroom mirror with lipstick, 
Try not to be an atheist today. Don't forget to remember God today. Rather, to remember your Creator, get this, it means that you never, ever let Him drift from being the supreme, all-satisfying center of your life. Don't let Him go. Don't let Him go. I had a girl tell me one time, as she was drifting from God into apostasy, she said, I just feel so distant from God. You probably do. But you need to know that if you do, you are the one that took the first step away. To remember your Creator is to conscientiously and continuously rehearse to yourself all the things about God that make you prefer Him to all other lovers and to all other treasures. That's what it means to remember Him, that you fight for your life to keep Him at the gravitational center of your existence. Remember your Creator. And yet that's very interesting, isn't it? That the title that He tells you to remember God by is as your Creator. Why does He do that? He could have picked any number of titles of God to cause you to focus on, but it's interesting. He wants you to think about God as the one who brought you into existence, and the reason he did, listen carefully, is because the fundamental starting point of what should define you is not your interests or your abilities or your career or your hobbies or your legacy or what makes you feel significant, but that you were brought into existence by another. That's the most important thing about you. That you are made. You are created. And you understand, the one, the fact that you are created means that you owe your existence to the one who created you. You owe your allegiance to the one who created you. He must be at the supreme, all-satisfying center of your life. That's what it means to remember. And so what Solomon wants to know and what I want to know is, does that define you? Do you remember your Creator? Do you fight for your life with everything you've got, with the sacred text on your knees? Do you fight to keep Him at the supreme, all-satisfying center of your life? That's the question. Or is there something else encroaching on the sacred ground of your soul to be reserved only for your Creator? But then Solomon goes and does something breathtaking. Believe it or not, he gives 15 elderly changes that happen in life that should not happen before you remember your Creator. In other words, he gives 15 poetic illustrations of growing old. And the point is you should remember God as your Creator before these things happen. And for the good of our souls, we're going to look at every single one of them. We'll get to the fear of God, but His command to fear God will be more meaningful precisely because of everything that precedes it. And so let's look at these changes. Fifteen changes. These are going to go fast. Change number one. Look at verse one. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Notice, before the days of evil come. And the years which arrive in which you say, I have no pleasure in them days of evil. Years arrive in which you have no pleasure. What is he talking about? He, he, he's talking about the years of growing old. He expands on this in verses 2 through 7. He means those days when the vision dims and the hearing fails and the taste buds fade, and the memory dimish, diminishes, and the teeth fall out, and the body wrinkles up, and the bladder doesn't work, and the organs begin to close up shop, and you stand on the brink of eternity. Remember your Creator before those days come. Change number two, look at verse two. Remember your Creator before the sun, and the light, and the moon, and the stars grow dark. And the clouds return after the rain. There's a debate about this, but that very well could refer to the gloom and depression that old age can bring. 
That storm imagery captures the the relentless challenges of growing old. It's like one storm after another. As soon as one storm is is over, another one rolls in. Each day it's a new pain in a different part of the body. Each day it's a different financial struggle to try to live on a fixed income. Each day it's another household repair project that you are no longer strong enough to fix. Each day it's another friend from college or high school going to the grave. The point is remember your Creator before that happens. Change number three, look at verse 15. Remember your Creator in the day that the keepers of the house tremble and the men of valor stoop. Two kinds of people there. You know who they are? They're the servants and the soldiers of the ancient world. They used to be strong, sturdy men. They seemed ageless and invincible, but now they're fragile. Now they're delicate men that tremble and shake. These were the war heroes who were once fearless and they, they wielded weapons of war, but now they, need, now they need walkers and wheelchairs and the teacher's message is clear. Remember your Creator before those days come. Changes four and five describe losing your teeth, losing your eyesight. Eventually teeth fall out. Eventually you get glaucoma and stigmatism and cataracts in the eyes, making everything you used to see fuzzy and unrecognizable. The point is, don't wait until that happens to remember your Creator. Changes 6, 7, 8, and 9 all describe the hearing loss that comes with age. Look what he says, the doors, remember your Creator before the doors close in the street. And the sound of the mill grows low. And one arises at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of the song shall be muffled. Notice Solomon talks about the closing of the gates in the street. It doesn't, it's not hard to see what he's talking about there, is it? Gates are ears, and I have huge gates. And one day they will be closed. And then not only will we lose our hearing, we'll lose our teeth. That's, that's what he means when he says the mill becomes quiet. Right? That, that's a metaphor for the, the teeth and the jaw and the crunching sound of eating food. But one day that's going to come to an end. Verse 4 goes on to describe the light sleep of the elderly and waking up at the slightest noise. They, they go to bed super early. They wake up super early. It's hard for them to sleep. That's what he's talking about. And then when he describes the, the daughters of the song shall be muffled, that describes the acute hearing loss of the age, the, the music that used to move you and, and mean something to you. It's garbled and muffled and the point of the teacher is clear. Remember your Creator before that happens. Keep Him. Fight to keep Him at the supreme, all-satisfying center of your lives. Change number 10. Look at verse 5. Still speaking about the elderly. They will fear from the heights and the terrors in the streets. What is He even talking about? He's talking about the, the frailty and instability that comes with growing old. I'm sure you do rock climbing now. Texans, they go to Colorado to ski because there are no mountains here. And so they, you go skiing now. You play basketball now. You do all the things you want to do. But the day is going to come when your driveway in the winter will look like a death trap. What used to be a routine trip to the store is now risky. It's scary when you're elderly, everything is too loud and too crowded and too fast and your reflexes are too slow. I still remember back in high school, our nearly blind and almost deaf elderly neighbor, Ab Johnson, mistaking the, ga- the brake for the gas pedal, plowing through our garage. His license was taken away, never left the home again, and died an ex-Mormon and an atheist. And the point is, remember Ab Johnson, and remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Change number 11, verse 5. Remember your Creator before the almond tree shall blossom. What is he, what is he talking about? Well, don't do it now, but all you have to do is Google, Google an image of an almond tree in the spring and it will be a white tree filled with white flowers. I think the point is clear. It looks like a head with gray hair, a, a, a picture of old age. You see, the, the point is there's still time. 
There's still time for you. Don't wait until the almond tree blossoms to remember your Creator. You, you, there is still time to have God, to keep God at the all-satisfying centerpiece of your life. Not tomorrow. Today. Today. Change number 12. Solomon says, remember your Creator before the grasshopper drags himself along. What does he mean? The picture is of a, of a dying locust no longer able to use his powerful legs to do the things he used to do. Now he hobbles and limps and drags himself along. And mark my words, today, today you feel agile. Today you feel invincible. But the day will come when you will no longer feel that way. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Change 13. Remember your creator before the caperberry becomes, ineffect be becomes ineffective. Anyone going to admit that is your favorite verse in your life? You know, my life verse is Ecclesiastes 12, verse 5. Remember your Creator before the caperberry becomes ineffective. What, what is that? What is he even talking about? Well, scholars have a field day with this. And sadly, many of them assume this to be some sort of sexual thing. It's not that. It's not that. This was the ibuprofen or Tylenol of the ancient day. It was a berry that had medicinal properties. And the point he is saying is, look, I hate to break the news to you, but the day is going to come when medicine is no longer going to do the trick for you. Why? Look at the end of verse 5. Day, the day of death is coming, for man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners shall walk around in the street. You can delay the grave for a while with diet and drugs and daily exercise, but you cannot avoid the grave. Its jaws are open and wide and gaping and ready to consume you, to swallow every person in history whole. The point is, remember, remember, you still have time. Remember your Creator before those days come. Change 14. Look at verse 6. Remember your Creator before the cord of silver is broken and the bowl of gold is crushed and the jar at the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. And all of that, believe it or not, is a picture of the day that you die. And we know that because of the very next phrase, which brings us to change number 15. Here it is. And the dust shall return to the earth where, from where it was, and the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. And Solomon brings up that painful memory that we would all rather forget. Namely, the day when the first man and first woman unleashed the virus of sin in the garden. He's basically quoting Genesis 3.19 here. One day our lives are going to end. And we will return to the dust. And we will be forgotten by human history to be eaten by worms. Funerals, unfortunately, are a fact of life. But also, that's not the only fact, because although our physical bodies die, our souls live forever and ever. You see, it's only a matter of time before you and I, we vanish off the planet into eternity, either to be eternally miserable in hell forever or to be eternally joyful with God forever. And the point is, before that happens, before that day comes, remember your Creator. The message is simple, but it's powerful, isn't it? Because if you don't remember your Creator, if you spend your life pursuing things other than Him, if you pursue your life looking to things other than Him to find ultimate meaning and significance and satisfaction, what is your life but verse 8? Futility of futilities, says the preacher. Everything is futility. What does he mean? He doesn't actually believe that. And that's not actually true. But that becomes true when you seek anything in life other than God for ultimate meaning and significance and satisfaction. Remember your Creator. But don't misunderstand. It's not that you can't pursue other things other than God. It's not that you can't enjoy things other than God. You can. And you should. There is a way to enjoy things other than God and not be idolatrous. 
There is a way to pursue things other than God and it not be sin. That's not the point. You see, most things in life are not inherently dangerous in and of themselves, but they automatically become dangerous when you seek to extract from them satisfaction that it was never intended to provide. You need to ask yourself this morning, for whom and for what are you living? You have to ask that. For whom or for what are you living? In what or in whom are you seeking your soul's deepest satisfaction? To whom or to what are you looking for ultimate significance? Because mark my words, relationships and love and marriage and education and career and family, those are sovereign gifts from the hand of God to be enjoyed. Mark my words, you seek them in the place of God and you will be bitterly disappointed. And that's the first and holy prerequisite. Necessary to find meaning and satisfaction in this life. Remember your Creator, which brings us to holy prerequisite number two. Number two, remember the divine source of Scripture. Remember the divine source of Scripture. You know, one of the frustrating things about reading and studying Ecclesiastes is that the commentators are all over the map. There are not many great commentaries out there on Ecclesiastes, and many of them, frankly, have perspectives about, most of them don't even believe Solomon wrote it at all, and, and many of them have unbelievably critical attitudes towards Ecclesiastes that he's superstitious, that he's pre-scientific, that it's the rantings of some chain-smoking agnostic philosopher, that the author, whoever he was, multiple authors, probably gloomy, suicidal pessimists in the grip of despair, who aren't even persuaded that heaven is a real thing. Which makes me kind of wonder, do those people even read Ecclesiastes? Do they actually read the book? Because the issue is what they say about Ecclesiastes and what Ecclesiastes says about Ecclesiastes is totally the opposite. And in verse 9, starting in verse 9, Solomon flashes his credentials. He's getting close to the end of the book. He's getting close to the, uh, revealing the meaning of life. And he wants to flash his credentials and show you that he is qualified to write about the meaning of life and tell you what it is. Two reasons. Two reasons why he's qualified to write a book on the meaning of life. Verse 9. Notice what he says. He says, And what remains, the preacher, speaking about himself, the preacher was a wise man. And he taught the people knowledge, and he pondered, and he searched, and he arranged many proverbs. Do you see what he's doing there? He was a wise man, and being wise doesn't qualify you to write Scripture, but a Scripture writer has to be wise. And yet we know from 1 Kings 3, 5 that Solomon was granted the supernatural gift of wisdom. He was, without a doubt, aside from Jesus Christ, the most brilliant man in the face of human history. This wasn't some second-rate philosopher speculating about the world of ideas. This is not some mystical, spiritual advisor or shaman reflecting on his experiences and what was true for him. What he just said, what has just come from his pen, what is about to come from his pen is nothing less than divine, supernatural, absolute truth. Solomon is qualified to write a book on the meaning of life. Why? Look what else he says. He taught the people knowledge. And he pondered, and he, arranged, he searched, and he arranged many proverbs. Do you see? He, he reminds us here that he wrote the book of Proverbs. That's very interesting. This isn't some rookie blogger assaulting the internet with his half-baked ideas. This guy wrote Proverbs. Without a doubt, one of the most life-changing books in the history of the world. If anyone is qualified to give a, meaning on the, on the, a lecture on the meaning of life, it is Solomon. And he is about to tell you what that is, but first notice verse 10. Look very carefully at the words he uses to describe the book of Ecclesiastes. What he's about to describe is Ecclesiastes. He's not speaking generally. He's talking about this book. 
The preacher sought to find, look, words of pleasure and an upright writing, words of truth. That's this book. He sought to find words of pleasure. What does that mean? It means that Solomon, that Ecclesiastes is in your Bibles to bring you pleasure. Now, here's the thing about Ecclesiastes. You read it and you think, I don't get much pleasure from that. It doesn't really make me happy. But you see, it does make you happy, not in some light, superficial sort of way, but in a surgical tool, digging out the infection kind of way. And and notice what he says, I I sought to write an upright writing, words of truth. That's very interesting. That's the doctrine of inspiration. He knows exactly what he's doing. He is writing scripture. This is not just true, this is truth itself. And then he goes on in verse 11. Solomon's no dummy. He knows that this book has been at times hard and painful to read. It is difficult, it is challenging, and it was designed to be that way. Look at verse 11. The words of wise men are like goads, he says. And masters of collections are like well-driven nails. They were given by one shepherd. Notice, notice very carefully. We're getting to the fear of God soon, but notice he describes his words as goads and nails. Do you know what goads are? Those are sharp sticks, cattle prods, used to move dumb animals into action. Guess what? We are the dumb animals. And His Word is the cattle prod to move us into action. You you understand the Word of God is designed to sting just a little bit. To step on your toes and and to make you uncomfortable. It's written, the Word of God is given to you to jab you in the ribs and to awaken you to the dangers of drifting from God. And so I ask you, are you drifting from God? You're here, and that's a fantastic sign. That is ex- this is exactly where you need to be. But are you drifting from God? That's why... Ecclesiastes is in your book to keep you from doing that very thing. It's the stick in your side, the splinter under the skin, the rock in your shoe to remember that ultimate meaning and significance and satisfaction are found only in your Creator. And then Solomon says that his words are like nails, literally tent pegs, driven into the ground. What does he mean? He means that the Word of God is written to give you stability. The Word of God is written to give you security. Solomon wrote this book, and all Scripture exists to be like nails hammered deep into your soul to keep you stable, to keep you from wandering, to keep you from making foolish decisions that bring ruin to your life. Solomon wrote this book to keep you from crashing and burning your life on the jagged rocks of sin and destruction. And then notice what he says at the end of the verse, the end of verse 11. He says, these words were given from one shepherd. Again, his language is strange because it's poetic and it's proverbial. What is he saying? I think the point is clear. He's saying, look, I am writing this book with my hand, with my pen, on literal paper. But at the end of the day, these words are from one shepherd. Meaning what? Meaning the Lord is my shepherd. These books are, these words are the words of a man, but really what they are, the words of the shepherd of your souls himself. What is he doing? What is the point? The point, this is all build up to what he is about to say. He flashes his credentials about his writing, not to show you that he is a good writer, but to show you that he is qualified to write a book about the meaning of life and And yet, and yet, I think we need to ask the question, pause here before we get there. The the question is, what is your perspective on God's Word? He's talking about God's Word. We should talk about this. What is your perspective on God's Word? What I mean is, do you listen to hear God speak in the pages of the text? Do you read... To let Scripture jab you, stab you with its tent pegs? I'm not asking if you theoretically agree that the Bible is useful. I'm asking, do you believe that it alone can solve the deepest dilemmas of the human soul? 
Either we believe in the sufficiency of Scripture or we do not. Do you believe that to read Holy Scripture is to hear God speak? Do you believe that we owe to Scripture the same reverence that we owe to God because it comes forth from Him? Either we believe in inspiration or we do not. Because you have to understand that the degree to which your life is changed and transformed is completely dependent upon how seriously you take the book that you're holding in your hands. And if you're not very consistent in getting into God's Word, I have zero interest in guilting you, but every interest in inspiring you and making you feel hungry. And so call it reading, call it study, call it meditation, call it what you will. You just need to know that if you ever hope to be wise or holy or happy or satisfied, this book must daily be a feast for your soul. And those are two, two prerequisites required to find meaning and satisfaction. Remember your Creator. Remember the divine source of Scripture. And here it is. Holy prerequisite number three. Remember the meaning of life. Remember the meaning of life. And here it is. The final scene, the final scene of Solomon's whodunit, the great, the great unveiling, pulling back the curtain, the entire point of our conference here together this weekend, it's all contained in the final words of this book, and yet, and yet, before he tells you what it is, master of suspense here, look what he says, verse 12, he says, beyond these, be warned, my son, this is verse 12. The making of many books, there is no end. And much studying is wearying to the body. Do you hear the warning he gives there? That, that is not a biblical justification for procrastination. Rather, what he's saying is, look, be warned, my son. Beyond these words, and by that he means the words in this book, beyond the words that I have written here, you just need to know that there are lots of other words out there. There's lots of other books, lots of other writings, lots of other documents that, that claim to have the secret to life. I mean, the stores are filled with, with endless material claiming to have the it factor. Here is the meaning of life. Here is happiness. Here is fulfillment. Here is how to make money. Here is the secret to health and, and success and love and fulfillment and relationships. And he's saying, not that you can't read those other things. You just be warned. So many other things out there claim to offer the meaning of life, but be warned about them because the meaning of life is right here. And he gets there. Brace yourselves. The dramatic, nail-biting final scene where the secret is revealed, the moment for which he makes you wait 12 emotionally and exegetically grueling chapters is here. The purpose of life revealed. Brace yourselves. Look at verse 13. Notice what he says. Notice his language. The end of the matter of everything has been heard. Stop there. That language should arrest you. The end of the matter of everything. Meaning what? Meaning what he is about to say is the most important thing in life. This is the end of the line right here. Your search for ultimate meaning and significance and satisfaction is over. And look what he says it is. Verse 13. The end of the matter of everything has been heard. Here it is. Fear God and keep His commandments. That's it. That's the meaning of life. That is the purpose of your existence. It's that. Which, which is so interesting to me, right? Other scripture writers put it differently. Equally valid ways. But you look at this text and it is clear as a laser. 
in Solomonic terms, the meaning of life is to fear God and keep His commandments. Which is significant, isn't it? I mean, about all the ways that he could articulate the, the purpose of your existence and the meaning of life, it's this. Why not loving God? Why not trusting God? Why, why not depending on God? Why, why, not, why not being exhilarated by God? Why not being satisfied in God? Why not those things? And if Solomon were here, he would say, no, no, that's what I mean. That is the fear of God. Fear of God is all of those things combined to fear God is faith in Him. It is loving Him. It is trusting in Him. It is depending on Him. It is being satisfied in Him. It is being exhilarated with Him. That's what's so incredible and precious and significant about the fear of God is that it's all of the appropriate responses to God bound together and woven together and expressed in one word. And yet you notice that the secret comes in two parts. Do you notice that fear God and keep His commandments? Notice that? That's very interesting, isn't it? And the reason why is because those two things are inseparably intertwined. You do one, you will automatically do the other. You fear God, and mark my words, you will keep His commandments. And yet, and yet, we have to ask the question, don't we? What does it mean to fear God? If this is such a big deal, we should get to the bottom of what this means. And last night we made an attempt to do so, didn't we? What does it mean to fear God? And we said last night that it's not to fear Him as a hideous monster or abusive, or an abusive, unstable father. It is categorically different than the fear of earthquakes and floods and fires and tornadoes and hurricanes. Rather, here it is, get this, fearing God is to rightly comprehend who He is in all of His uncreated majesty and towering supremacy. It is the raw, delicious terror that you taste in your soul when you begin to understand the sheer magnitude of the God who spoke galaxies into existence. When you begin to grasp the towering majesty of God, the, the Himalayan heights of the God who never had a beginning. To fear God means that you have that profound God consciousness that knows that no matter where you are, God is there in the totality of His being. To fear God means that who He is is so real to us that we would never dare trifle with Him nor treat Him as common. To fear God means that all of the accumulated glories that we have learned about Him, that they have coalesced together in a compelling vision of reality that shape and define and determine who we are in the secret moments of our life when no one is watching except Him. Or as we put it this way, to fear God is to tremble before Him as the treasure of your soul. Tremble before the treasure. That's the fear of God. And what this does is raise the question, doesn't it? How do you grow in this? How do you increase in the fear of God? How is this produced in the soul? Isn't that the question? And the answer is, to fear God, you have to see God. To fear God, you have to see God. And by that I mean see Him. Oh no, keep that going. Keep going. And by see God, I mean see Him in the pages of Holy Scripture. Because you understand, don't you? Listen very carefully. The fear of God is cultivated by the majesty of God seen and savored in the Word of God. 
The fear of God is cultivated by the majesty of God seen and savored in the Word of God. In other words, careful, methodical meditation upon the text is God's means of awakening, glad-hearted treasuring of Him above all things. Because you understand, unless we see God, really see Him, the God who spoke galaxies into existence, who numbers the stars, who became a man, who calmed the sea with His voice, who was slain for sinners, who rose Himself from the dead, who holds the universe into being by the word of His power, who is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come, the one before whom every knee will bow. Unless we are captivated by this God, the God who will come again to slaughter His enemies and establish His kingdom on this planet, unless we are captivated by this God, we will always just be casual and lukewarm and profoundly susceptible to the sins that would destroy us. Which is precisely why the Solomonic meaning of life is to fear God and keep His commandments. Those two, those two things are inseparable. You can't have one without the other. The measure of our fear of God is expressed and results in our obedience to the Word of God. Do you see that? The measure of our fear of God is expressed in and results in our obedience to the Word of God. And so knowing that then, knowing that the fear of God results in a holy life, here's the question. Here's the question. What lingering areas of struggle, temptation, sin, disobedience would you love to see transformed in your life? What would you love to see? What would you love to see this week, this month, this year? What are those nagging, hard-to-reach sins that just never seem to go away? Men, if you're married, maybe the better question is, what area of your life would your wife love to see transformed by the chisel of holy truth? What would she love to see? Those who live with roommates or siblings or you still live with your parents, the people that see you in your most unguarded and vulnerable moments, who see you in your most raw, unfinished areas of your life yet to be conquered by Jesus Christ, what areas of your life do you think they would love to see transformed by the sacred text of Holy Scripture? Because my point in asking you that is, now you know the secret to change. Now you know the power to change. It is to fear God. And how you grow in the fear of God is being exhilarated by God. And how you be exhilarated by God is by seeing His majesty displayed in the pages of Holy Scripture. Now, two more things Solomon does and then we're done. After he gives away the secret and the meaning of life, he gives two reasons, two reasons why you should fear God. I love Solomon. He's very logical. He's tough to read. It's challenging, but it is so worth it. Two reasons why you should fear God and keep His commandments. Reason number one, look at the end of verse 13. Why should you fear God and keep His commandments? He says, for this applies to every person. But you know what? The Hebrew is far more blunt and aggressive. What it actually says is ki ze kol ha'adam, which means this is all of the man. What does that mean? It means that fearing God and keeping His commandments, yes, it does apply to every person, but His point is this defines who you are. This defines who you are. 
This is to be the essence of what makes you, you. This should define you. This is the very reason you exist. As finite, created human beings, we are in our existential sweet spot when we tremble before the dreadful, sovereign majesty of the God who caused you to exist. Reason number two, that you should fear God and keep His commandments. Number two, look at verse 14. Why should you fear God, keep His commandments? For God will bring every act into judgment, everything that is hidden, whether it is good or whether it is evil. And that changes everything, doesn't it? That changes everything. There is a day on the calendar of the universe and it is fixed and it will not be rescheduled and it is called the judgment. One day you will step off the planet, I will step off the planet into eternity and we will stand before God, believer in Christ or unbeliever who has rejected Christ and all of us will answer to God for the choices that we have made. We will be held accountable for everything we, has done, we have done. Some will receive undeserved rewards from God because of Christ. Some will receive well-deserved condemnation because of their own sin. But either way, the great reality that changes everything Everything is that God will judge. This is real. This is real. And you should tell people about this. They should know. Who cares if you sound like a weirdo? You will. You need to talk to them about this day. Because it changes everything about how you live even at this moment. And what it should do is cause you to fear God. And like that, he's done. <laughs> the book ends on a cliffhanger. Did you notice? It's brilliant. Seconds after pulling back the curtain and revealing the meaning of existence in dramatic fashion, the novel ends, cuts to black. There's no final scene that relieves the tension. No fade out on a beautiful sunset. No chipper, romantic music queued up at the end while the credits roll, just the sudden, dramatic ending designed to make the point of the book even more unforgettable. Fearing God is not just a really good idea or one possible good response out of many possible good responses. No, no. Fearing God is the meaning of life itself. Let's pray.